Welcome to the Exchange Gallery. We are here tonight to celebrate the current show that's up on the walls here, UFOs, which here stands for Unfinished Objects. The idea of this show came up a year ago. We were talking with one of the artists who has displayed work here, generally paintings, but she is primarily a quilt maker. And in the course of her conversation, one day here in the gallery, she told us that every quilt maker has a bin full of UFOs, unfinished objects. And the light bulb went on. And we thought, you know, surely other artists working in other media would also have some unfinished things. So we'll do a show with unfinished objects. Should be relatively low pressure. You know, there's no, there's no deadline except to bring work in. It doesn't have to be done. <laughs> so we put the call out. And we have work here from 22 artists. There are 38 pieces in the show. We hung the show on a Saturday, and believe it or not, it was an unfinished show. Because work came in on Tuesday, and then the next Friday, and then the next Monday, and then another week after that. So it has been an unfinished show. The unfinished object show is unfinished. Yet more work came in for this show last Thursday. For, for those of you who are watching online, we are doing this on a Tuesday evening. On Thursday last week, the River Poets were here, a group of people who, they're obviously all poets, they work in various ways, and to inspire themselves and each other, they will often take on a theme for their monthly meetings. The theme this month was this show. So they encouraged their membership to come down, look at the show, or go online and look at the pictures on our website, and make poetry to go along with one or more of the pieces here. And there are poems in a few of the few places here that came in, once again, helping to keep this show unfinished, but building. The artists who have work in this show thought about it in many different ways. So there are some pieces here that are simply unfinished. We have a number of quilts that people started and then, for whatever reason, either got sick of or just had to put aside. This one, Brian Spees started this after the 2016 election, when his head had basically exploded. He got only so far, after the 2020 election, he, he took it out again and then decided that it still was not worth finishing this quilt because there's so much unfinished work in this country that we haven't done. The quilt that's on the wall around back there by Robin Beck, she made all of the fabric for it. Hand-dyed, tie-dyed fabric, put it all together, and then never got around to putting a backing or actually quilting it, folded it up, put it in her closet, forgot it for years. For this show, she took it out, and she looked at it, and most of the fabric had faded. And she thought, ugh. But she brought it in anyway. I asked her when she brought it in, if she'd like to put a price on it. And she was like, no, after this show, I'm just going to throw this thing away. Well, while she was here, I hung it up on the wall. And she got to stand back. Robin stood back, got to see it, and said, you know, it's not so bad. Don't put a price on it. I'm going to take it home and finish it after the show. Still unfinished, but there is something approaching a happy ending there. The painting there by Chris Mathias looks finished. It's the one all the way up front there. Chris is a very meticulous painter. And if you look carefully, even if you get way up close, there's not a brush stroke to be seen. He's working with teeny tiny little brushes. It's a painting of his cousin that he did for her. It went to her house down in Bucks County. It hung on her wall. Chris came to visit. He looked at it. He said, no, that's not right, and pulled it off the wall and took it home and kept painting on it which he could probably do approximately forever. So there are all kinds of unfinished here. We are now going to hear the first of our stories about some kind of UFO from Tara McNish. It's kind of tied in with this show and uh, the story along how I processed doing the show. I brought in some music. My son had something he didn't finish. But um, the other day I stopped in and I had no story yet. 
And then Oren's like, do you know anybody that would want to tell a story? And I was like, I'll put a PSA about it on Facebook. So I'm going to read you my extensive little list of replies I got for UFO. So I said, anyone have a story about UFOs? Miss Maddie said, look up Todd C's. Anthony Pansiza, yeah, I saw them numerous times when I lived in Vallenberg Air Force Base on the central California coast when I was a kid. They frequent military bases that have nuclear weapons. Honcho Rude Boy, no stories, but I low-key want to be abducted. Beam me up. <laughs> Got a thumbs up by Curtis Sweeney. And then I go in to explain, like, listen, the exchange is having this wonderful event. And I said, use the acronym. Nobody listened. <laughs> Keith Bozert, I've had what I call flying jellyfish, flying above me, following me, moving and turning like massless, white, glowing creatures of effortl effortless love. I wasn't doing any drugs either. <laughs> Brian Warner, be cool to be abducted in a weird way, minus the probing. <laughs> the reply to that, Brian War or C Chloe James, Brian Warner, probing sounds like a good time. Jeff, I want to see one, I believe for sure. Jen, yep, Dave and I didn't see one, but we heard one. We heard the hatch open behind us. We went camping many years ago in Sailorsburg, PA, in a field where they had reported tons of UFO sightings. Tyler, I've seen them, big balls of light, something's moving. Something sta sometimes stationary, sometimes fading away, slowly, sometimes abruptly disappearing. Alyssa, my cousin, I saw one right there in bloom. We were there in our backyard when we lived in a trailer. It was a huge triangle shape, black with the lights off, but it was close enough and, sl and slow, and you could see where the lights were, and there was a low hum. It was amazing. Emily, I have so many UFO stories. Ed, multiple stories. Scott, I saw them at Penn's Peak a few years ago. They were awesome. I'm assuming that's a band. <laughs> Alicia, yes, that's all I got. John, saw them in a concert a bunch of times. Must have been at the same Penn's Peak one. Shane, saw a blue electric light in the sky. It looked like a transformer blowing up, and there were no clouds, so I don't think it could be lightning. Trey. Saw my first one ever at age six while standing in, on the back deck with both of my parents and our neighbors. It flew directly over our house and around 200 feet or so, then dropped down into the woods behind our house. There was a river back there. It had to have dropped down over the river and flown upstream. It lit up the woods, though. It was a silver disc with multicolored lights all around it. About 10 minutes after it flew over, a military helicopter flew over our house our neighbor's house with a spotlight shining all around on the ground. It flew off the same direction as the craft. And then I have, if I have seen lots of, or I have lots of stories, pretty sure I've been on one at least once in my life. <laughs> all right. And I'm sure I'm going to get more replies to that, but that is unfinished as well. Next, we have Paul Loomis, who is going to share with us a song, although since it's not done, maybe it's just a son. So I try to make a point, right, of knowing the words to my songs, um, but I started this one on Sunday. And so I don't really even know it yet, right? And I can't know it because it's not done, really. Um, so this song lacks, it lacks a couple things, right? It lacks a good ending, or any ending for that matter. It lacks a bad ending. Um, it also lacks, sorry, I'll get a little closer here. It also at, lacks a little bit of exposition. So just to fill in where, it, where it's missing. Um, one thing you should know, there's a book I mentioned. I had this book called A Guide to BLM Lands, like Bureau of Land, Man Land Management Lands in the w West where you could camp for free, right? So it's basically a book for cheap people who want to camp for free, right? And, it was already outdated when I bought it, right, and only got worse. Um, so that gets mentioned. And are any of you, are you familiar with the work of Philip Glass? Yes. Right? That, so, 
No, well, yes, being excited is okay. So, right, Philip Glass is sort of a, a minimalist composer, right? That's, um, so that gets referenced as, as well in the song. Those are the... Well, I set out from Lafayette Two liters of Dr. Pepper by my side Rolled into Houston 16 hours later I was all hopped up on caffeine and sugar And the excitement of the ride I went down through Indiana, Illinois Missouri, Arkansas Louisiana over into Texas I was looking straight ahead I didn't see anything at all Well my old best friend Kevin moved to Houston and so that's where I drove He said there's a lot of country down here that you should get to know So we spent a whole day gathering supplies And then we hit the road And we drove three hours west out to Austin Camped with coyotes, deer, and toads Well, this woman in Sonora, Texas, she wouldn't sell me beer. She said, your Indiana driver's license isn't really legal here. But the pit kid who bagged the groceries asked to see my license plate. He said, with a kind of reverence, your home, it's very far away. Well, somewhere west of Roswell, New Mexico, things started getting weird. The roads my book said we could take, well, they never appeared. There was somewhere near Fort Stockton we thought that we could stay. But all the signs around, they said, you'd better get away. They said, no stopping, no camping, no parking, no photos allowed. Well, all the other cars looked sinister as they followed us around. Oh, the night was getting dark and the plot was getting deep. Kevin took the opportunity to go to sleep. I was alone. I had the music on. It was Koyana Scott C. 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 All the roads were wrong, but they all looked the same. I passed some great big airport that didn't have a name. And in the sky above, passed some kind of blinking flame. A blue light passed over me, it was trailing yellow sparks oh it might not seem like much right now but it's different in the dark in the dark
song. So our next storyteller is someone else who has work in the show here for the first time, Leon Cass. So um, I came here from soccer practice, so I have my cleats on, but I really was into drawing when I was like four or five, and then I kind of just took a break from it for a while, but I think, the fly's buzzing around here, I th um, about a year ago, um, or a year and a half ago, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, so I have pump and all that, and all that jazz, so, but um. I drew, I draw, and it's just kind of been a way to help me cope with life, and I don't truly think that my work is finished, nor my condition is finished, because we haven't found a cure for it, yet the technology is getting more advanced every day, so that's kind of why I submitted my work to Unfinished, because um, I just don't really feel like anything that I draw will ever be finished because, well, I don't have enough time to do it, and also I just like leaving it the way that it is, not, add not adding anything else. A lot of people say that you have to, in order to draw, you have to be good. That's not it at all. You just have to make something that you like, and that's all that really matters. Leon's two pieces are among those that inspired one of the poets. So before you all go here, make sure that you check out the poetry on the wall. One of the things that, that Leon said about how it, you know, it's not about being good, it's about being happy with the work that you do. And that is fundamental to what we do here at The Exchange. Mary, you have brought a piece in which actually was not in the show even half an hour ago. So once again, the unfinished show keeps on unfinishing. Come tell us about what you would like to tell us. Well, it started off with a drawing that's on the, I pinned it onto the fabric piece. And um, I started listening to the music that goes with him. That has been a theme, this business of music with art, music with art, music with art. And I've, I've been circling the drain on that for years about how it, influences one another. And I recently did a show here that I had as the premise, if a chord sounds nice, then the colors that correspond energetically to the notes will sound and look pleasing. That was the basis of the show. And I worked for like two or three years on that idea. And then when you said, this is an unfinished show, and I was going, I meant to get it out earlier. I really did. But anyway, it's here. And I don't know if I can talk about it because I'll start crying. That's when I made that, it was a break from painting. And I really enjoyed fabric work for a little while or maybe even longer. But ultimately I came back to painting. But why I left it, I found out for the first time when I did that, that there is a, another side to what I do with painting and art in general, graphic stuff. I love it, but I also found out there's a special way I get into it. And it's because I've always had the support of my dad this high. And I, he, he would tell me stories for hours and draw the three things that he knew how to draw cowboy hat, a horse's head, and a gun, like a pistol. And he knew I loved cowboys, just forever. And he never stinted on the time to sit and talk to me about the cowboys and draw this, and I'd ask him to draw it again, and I'd draw it, and that would go on for a long time. He had a full-time job, and we were living with my grandparents, who were tenant farmers and he came back home to live with them so he could help them. I don't know when he found time for this thing of mine with art, but it taught me how it feels when you're really tied and connected to your topic in art. That's for me. And it became the basis for 
a lifetime of drawing people, just portraits. And everybody says, how can you do that? It's so hard. But it isn't for me because I love it so much. And I have examples, and we can look at them if anybody's interested afterward. But what I can do, like I did with him, is I went into a place that is almost inside his life, his head. And that's what comes out. Um, it, it's, it's a knowing of some kind. And I, I don't understand it, but it happens for a lot of portraits that I do that uh, and nobody in this room will ever ask me to do their portrait because I do get inside whatever is being communicated by a person and it ends up for everybody to see. <laughs> and, you know, that's my, my one teacher told me, he said, don't expect people to be lining up for this stuff, Mary, because it's not going to be an easy sell if people know that you can kind of find a way into the inside person. And so when I put this away, it's because it just felt so draining. And I, I came to know him through music because there's a song about him. And if I, when I play it, that'll I'll have to be done talking because I won't be able to keep talking about him because I know what his life was like. I don't know how I do that. And... Maybe I don't want to know. I'm just okay with it now. Not with him, but with the rest of the stories that I hold. The only end to the story is, is that it taught me that it was something that I needed to acknowledge as a gift and use it. But um, it was hard with him, harder than anybody else, because I felt like I was in the cell with him. As a matter of fact, I've made three or four other figures that were going to go with him in a large mural. I mean, this is only the beginning of the unfinished, and it was in a bag. And about two years ago, I just threw it all out. I couldn't. I knew I'd never finish it, and I, I won't. But uh, he, he taught me how to be with that element of how I produce art. And uh, that was a big step for me to take because it was all okay in the end that that's how I am. It's okay. It's not what other people talk about when they talk about art, but I suppose some people do have that experience. I, I think they probably do. Maybe they have enough sense not to talk about it. <laughs> so Bojangles was a real person and he, he was born into poverty and uh, he started making it big at the vaudeville scene and the black vaudeville scene. And then Shirley Temple had him in some of her movies. And then after that period of time, he ended up in poverty again in the jail, danced across the cell. I was there. It was like, that's where I was. I, when I heard the song, it became real, like a real experience. And that happens for me with other people, too. But don't be scared. I won't take your phone numbers or anything. I won't be calling you to ask if you want to sit for a portrait. <laughs> but I do, all, all beings are fair game. Trees, dogs, horses, people, they all have something to tell me. And the only thing that comes out of those sessions is a graphic image. And they're all either just me sees it or other people can see it, but they don't know what it is. It takes them in, and they're, they can experience some of it, too. But when I play the music, that's when it really, that's when I have to stop. So that's it. <laughs> it's interesting that we have a, a song familiar to many of us, but someone else's experience of that song can be very, very different than our own over time. And that's part of the reason that we're here as well, doing these stories. By telling each other our stories, we learn more not only about who each of us is, but who we are collectively as a community, and even as who we are as human beings. That's why we are here, is so we can share those things and build that sense of this community. Here are all of these different people in it 
who make up the whole. So thank you all. We do have more. We have another musician who is now coming not to sing, but to talk. So Kat Holdren. All right. Well, I was going to read one thing, um, but I might not. No, you're fine. Um, no, I will. No, I, I changed my mind already. All right, I'm going to read two, but one is, one is very short, if that's okay. Okay. I'm just going to find it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, well, Oren mentioned, you know, our country is an unfinished object, so that's what this is kind of about. It's called Liberty and Justice in a Time of White Supremacy. Mock. God bless what? Give me your top three. I pledge allegiance to no one, especially not the Mitches and Lindsays of this undivided nothingness, especially not the 13 stripes bloodied red by your three-fifths bullshit, especially not the good guys with guns argument, especially not ammunition that explodes on impact, especially not ammunition that explodes on impact killing 10-year-olds, especially not the saggy faces of old white evangelists at abortion clinics, and certainly not this goddamn country. Thanks, Ma. Thank you. All right, this is the other one. On the day that Wynne Bruce lights himself on fire on the steps of the Supreme Court, I feel nothing. Maybe it's SSRI withdraw, or that I'm not sleeping, or that the world is at war. I couldn't say. I read endlessly about his life and his motivation. I Google political self-immolation and find hundreds of stories, some date back to the year 577. In 1963, Tik Kwong Duk, a Buddhist monk, drove to the middle of a busy intersection in Saigon, assumed a lotus position, doused himself in gasoline, and lit himself on fire. His heart didn't burn in the street, and it didn't burn at his funeral when he was cremated. Instead, it stayed intact and was preserved. I wonder how long it would take my heart to burn. I wonder if I'd ever have the guts. I wonder if I've ever loved something so much. I wonder if I could harness a fraction of their serenity if I would be okay then. My grandmother died at 63 from a brain aneurysm. It's been 15 years, and my grandfather still talks about her every day. Remember how she, remember when we... I think maybe that there is more than one way to light your heart on fire. Maybe there is more than one way to preserve something that made every sunrise technicolor, the waves touch the sand in slow motion, the mountains easier to move, that made words melt in your mouth like vanilla ice cream. Remember? We'll just leave this here. Uh, thank you very much, Kat. Magdi, do you have a story as well? Okay, come tell. Hi. I just want to see what this is like for a second. <clears throat> um, so I feel like a little bit of an imposter. I've never done this before. Um, I used to want to be a creative writer when I was much younger. I used to love writing stories. And then I went into science and did a lot of scientific writing, and now I do a lot of political writing, and it's all very dry, and I don't get to do much creative writing anymore. <clears throat> anyway, um, I was sitting outside with my best friend, Kat Holdren, who you just got to see, and um, she was like, people are sharing stories over next door, and maybe we should go share stories. And so I was like, well, maybe I have a story from back in the day that I wrote you know, and I found one, so I'm going to read that, and I apologize, it's like old, like I wrote a long time ago, um, and I haven't done this before, and I mean, I haven't, stun <clears throat> I haven't stood in front of a microphone like this before, and I also haven't read off of my iPhone before, and the text is so tiny, so um, I hope that I'm just going to take my time, and I hope it's okay. All right, and, and actually... Sorry, if I move to the other side, you can't hear me, so I'll stay here. Um, I feel like I wanted to write, and I wrote this stuff, and then I put it away for a long time, and now I'm pulling it back out again. So, hey, unfinished object, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So this story is called um, Still Life. <clears throat> Sorry. The dentist presses clamps against my teeth, stringing them full of latex and dental floss. 
and I close my eyes and begin to count all of the men I've ever kissed. Sometimes I do this at Peter's house when I cannot sleep. It works just like counting sleep, sheep. To be honest, though, most of the time, it is men I have slept with. It is only when that list becomes too repetitive that I switch it back to kissing. Kissing makes the list much longer and complicates each landmark on the map. I cannot even remember my first kiss. I had told my friends I didn't want to play spin the bottle in the basement because my kissing virginity was sacred. Maybe it was Daniel Ryan, though, the pediatrician's son, who was so tall and curly-haired and freckled and licked his lips every time the bottle slowed towards his corduroyed knee. Or maybe it was Scott Godbout, who was blonde and about two inches shorter than me. I can't remember. I open my eyes and look at the dentist. I can't move my mouth. They've sucked all of the moisture out. His eyes are pale blue, and he asks me, are you okay? I close my eyes against this indignity. I do remember, though, after spin the bottle, Scott Godbout lay between me and Shanna Strode on a pile of old sweaters, and he turned to me, and then he turned to Shanna Strode, and then he turned to me, and he kissed both of us for hours. We were 12. The map of kisses is long from Scott, now to Peter, to others, and back to Peter again. Sometimes I feel guilty, with Peter there beside me now, counting all those kisses. And so I try to count all the trips I've ever taken, every time I've ever been on an airplane, every teacher I've ever had. But none of this holds attention like men. I've never counted sheep, but I'd guess to go to sleep you really do have to be wrapped. With kissing, I never get around to the end before I go dreaming. I go around and around and miss all kinds of stops in between. I look up. Both the dentist and the hygienist have colds, I can tell. I know because they sniffle with their hands deep inside my mouth. But it's too late for me to say anything between the latex and the steel. This boy I knew once, Walter Morrow, told me that he loved me. He was actually my third cousin, once removed. So ours, he said, was a forbidden love. Then there was Joseph, growing up sad in a family of professional clowns, who kissed me with eyes wide open and palms closed by my waist, always fumbling over that tragic tension between himself and joy. And then before Joseph, though, I must pay more attention to this chronology. There was Derek, 16 months before he wandered into the woods with a bottle of vodka and a fistful of Valium, clumsily unbuttoning my shirt in the girls' locker room, telling me my breasts were beautiful. And then there was Jose the Spaniard, before our love went as sour as the sourest thing to have ever soured, trying so hard to teach me to roll my R's, kissing me. Before then, months later, methodically unscrewing all the locks off the bathroom's bathroom door so I couldn't hide in the bathroom and cry. And then, before Jose, there was that pug-nosed Irish boxer whose face looked like it had known and loved a cr trash compactor, whispering on a deserted street at 3, 3 a.m., where should we go? And after the boxer, there was Leonard, who was older than me. Of course he was older who kissed me with a booger climbing out of his nose. Leonard, whose booger migrated from his nose to my cheek. Leonard, who looked at my face and saw his booger as my booger. Leonard, who looked at the booger on my cheek and said, through a deep, affectionate, older man's sigh, oh, sweetheart. And then there was Michael of overlapping teeth buying a rose from a man on the street as if it would make me glow instead of cringe. I tried to fake a glow. David breathing through his mouth and playing the saxophone as a prelude and an epilogue and everything else. While I lay there and tapped my foot and said, yeah, 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 that sounds great, David. Three men on trains and one in a bathroom. Tony Snodgrass sleeping in a waterbed next to a handgun, 
keeping his fingernail clippings in a jar in the closet. Drunken Stephen something something whispering into my neck that he knew that he was ugly, and he also loved how I loved carrots. And Dick, the theoretical feminist, telling me between the analysis of homoeroticism of pirates in 1850 um, and the revelation that in order to understand the war, one must truly first understand that Hitler was in love with his own father, that I made him feel like a giant, and then when he told me, made me feel like a child. And then, like a child, I was angry, I felt, with him, because before him, I'd kiss Latin fire, who kissed like an overeager puppy, a ginger-haired salsa-dancing lawyer from Alabama who, so profoundly altered by his four months abroad in Argentina, could never stop struggling over my coldness and said, I guess I'm just used to more Latin fire. And then I wonder where I can remember Peter, who I think must be so kind, but always closes his eyes dreams of sitting on his porch with a banjo and a cup of coffee, dreams of just himself and leaves in the morning to water his cucumbers. And then I open my eyes again and the dentist bends, squinting over my torso and towards my mouth, drills through the rot in my tooth. And all I can think is, what a stupid life. When Walter Morrow told me he loved me, we were lying on top of a hill by a park near my house. I remember Walter wore brown tennis shoes with toes that poked out when he walked, and his nose was long with a break in the bone. Do you feel it? He asked me, taking my hand, wrapping his thumb and index finger around my wrist, lifting it and running my fingers along the cracked edge of his nose. Do you feel where it broke? Yes, I said nervously. It's there, and I pressed the bump lightly with my finger, fearful of wounding him further. Walter told me that he'd never been able to see shapes in clouds and that it's a gift he wished he had. <clears throat> I thought this was strange, but all I said that what it that it was no gift, that you just look up and then you see. And that's, what ha and that's when it happened. Walter Morrow leaned over on one elbow, kissed me on my cheek, right beneath my eye, and said, I love you, you know. Do you know that, he asked me. He kissed me by my ear, then by my lower lip. He kissed me on my ponytail. Do you know it, he asked again. Yes, I said. I know it. I love you, Walter said. Yes, I know it, I said again, with slightly less resolve. I turned to Walter and closed my eyes. He kissed the space between them. I was 14 then. Walter was 12. <laughs> the hygienist leans over my torso. All your cavities are between your teeth, she says. This is another way of saying I should start flossing, I think. I turn my straight-jacketed face to her face. She taps my arm hard when the dentist pushes a needle into my gum. Her eyes are also some shade of pale faded blue. Okay, that's it.